Hi, everyone. Welcome to the NIGMS webinar for pre-doctoral T32 training grants in basic biomedical sciences. So as you know, we have a new FOA uh, and it's especially for the training grants in basic biomedical sciences, not MSTP. So this webinar is for uh, those programs, those applicants who want to put in an application for training grants in basic biomedical sciences. I'm Shiva Singh, branch chief for the pre undergraduate and pre-doctoral training at NIGMS. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And, and here's the outline of what we propose to do today, the agenda. Uh, after the introductions, uh, we'll have uh, opening remarks by our institute director, Dr. John Loris. That would be followed by an overview and details of the application process by Dr. Alison Gami. She is the director of uh, training workforce development and diversity. Uh, she'll be followed by uh, a talk by Stephanie Constant, chief of the scientific review branch. Uh, and she'll talk about the, the review process. Uh, finally, Lisa Moller, a uh, team leader in grants administrative branch, uh, our administration branch, she'll talk about the budget. And finally, we'll have 15 to 30 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, next slide, please. So I, at the outset, I want you to know, and, and I sent this, this message in, in my last email also, that this webinar is being recorded and, and we will post the, the video as well as the slides on the T32 training grant website. Um, and, and also that please send your questions, type your questions in, in the chat box. Um, and Dr. Sidella Blatch, uh, she's a program director in TWD. She's gonna read it out and, and then either Alison or I will answer it if it's a programmatic question. If it's a, a review related question, then Dr. Constant will answer it. If it's a budget related question, then Lisa will uh, answer it. Uh, and if it's a miscellaneous question, then, then we'll, we'll figure out who would be the right person to answer it. But Dr. Sidella Blatch will read the questions out. So with that, next slide, please. Uh, as usual, uh, uh, a word of disclaimer that this is not all comprehensive uh, information uh, that we're going to be presenting here. It's just an overview. And please do consult the FOA for all the details of everything that you need to include, everything that you don't need to include. And if you have any questions about anything, certainly you can uh, send me an email and, and I, I will respond to that. So with that, uh, next slide, please. I now invite Dr. John Loris. Uh, he needs no introduction, actually. Uh, all of you know that his vision and leadership has truly transformed uh, the Institute, not only the graduate training component, but also how we do research funding and the research enterprise as funded by the NIGMS. So, Dr. Loris. Thanks, Shiva, and welcome everyone. Thanks for attending. I'll keep the remarks extremely brief. I just wanna say um, this is part of our continuing journey that we started about five years ago to um, help modernize graduate education in, in biomedical sciences. This new FOA uh, keeps many of the new features of the previous one that hopefully at this point you are all familiar with um, and, and adds some focus on additional areas. Um, for example, things such as um, developing a safe and inclusive research environment, lab safety, uh, and some other issues. Um, we hope to continue to partner with you to try to make these changes um, happen in, in the most productive way possible. Uh, as you know, I think we've been giving uh, quite a number of supplements out to help catalyze these changes and help allow you to explore different possibilities. Um, we are giving whatever guidance we can. Allison and I, along with Michelle Bond, the program director at NGMS, 
have just written a um, perspective for molecular biology of the cell about safety in, in training environments. And that will be coming out in October, and I hope you'll all uh, take a look at that. Um, but this is a partnership, and we, we hope to continue to work with the academic community to uh, really modernize how we train the next generation of biomedical researchers. So thanks to all of you for your efforts. Thank you, John. Uh, if we may have the next slide, please. And uh, Alison needs no introduction as well. Uh, she's the leader of our division, the Division of uh, Training, Workforce Development and Diversity. Uh, so she's gonna cover the, give an overview as well as the application process. Uh, uh, Alison. Thanks Shiva um, and thanks everyone for joining. I just want a few housekeeping notes. We are recording this and um, we will also be posting these slides. So don't feel as though you have to furiously uh, take notes. Um, we're, we're gonna make them available to you um, shortly. Um, so just wanna give you a, a sort of broad overview of the, the changes and, and what we're doing. And as you know, we're encouraging changes in um, biomedical graduate training. And the idea is to keep pace with the rapid evolution of the research enterprise. And as you know, it's becoming increasingly um, complex, interdisciplinary and collaborative. Um, what we're looking for is high quality programs that will um, provide mentored research experiences um, and research training and additional opportunities that will give trainees the skills they need to transition um, to the next stage um, in the biomedical research workforce. Um, we don't, our intention is not that you add um, additional things on top of existing structures. Um, we really encourage you to um, think creatively about your graduate um, training program and how you can um, rethink and um, move into um, new approaches to graduate training. So there's some major themes. Again, these are just, this is just the, the broad overview. Um, we really focus on skills development, and this is using evidence-based approaches to provide students or trainees with the technical, operational, and professional skills they need. And some of those are listed um, at the bottom of the slide. Um, similar to a research grant, we want to see specific aims um, where there are training objectives and they should be obtainable and measurable. Um, in the in the time frame of the award, we also have a strong emphasis on rigor and transparency and the responsible and safe conduct of research. That it should be throughout the entire training experience and not just courses um, tacked on here and there. Um, you will see that there's a lot of language around um, having a strong commitment to diversity and inclusion. Um, as John mentioned, uh, we're really promoting um, cultures of safety where there is um, ownership at all levels for providing safe environments for um, research training. Um, also encourage mentor training and oversight, um, and in particular of the mentor-mentee match. Um, career preparedness is also a focus of the funding announcement um, where, where we wanna see programs providing um, the knowledge and skills that trainees need to transition to the next step. Um, another important component is having strong institutional support for research training and there's a, a 10 page letter that I'm going to talk about later that really details the types of institutional support that we're looking for. Evaluation is also a key part of this, um, of these funding announcements. We wanna make sure that these programs are successful in meeting their uh, training goals and there's an expectation of to collect and disseminate um, the outcomes. So the program objective, the overall objective, as I mentioned, is very trainee focused and we wanna see a diverse pool of well-trained scientists that have these skills that are necessary to transition to the next stage. As I mentioned, we have a strong focus on diversity and this is at every level you can imagine. This includes the kinds of science and um, to the regions in which their uh, training is conducted, to the backgrounds of the people um, doing the research. And we, we believe strongly that it contributes to excellence in research training environments. And you can't really have excellence in research training without um, having diversity at all levels. Um, so, uh, some people are, are, you know, I keep talking about skills and the technical, operational, professional skills, and people say, okay, what is it you're, you're talking about? And I just wanna take a few slides to go through specifically 
some of the skills um, that we're talking about. So having a broad understanding across a broad um, range of biomedical disciplines, um, expertise in a specific um, scientific discipline, and the skills um, to independently acquire the knowledge needed to advance um, a chosen field. The ability to think critically and independently and to identify important research questions and approaches that will push forward the boundaries um, of their areas of study. Also, um, having a strong foundation in scientific reasoning, rigorous research design, experimental methods, quantitative and computational approaches, um, and data analysis and interpretation. We also want to see the skills to conduct research in the safest manner possible and a commitment to approaching biomedical research responsibly, ethically, and with integrity. Um, also to have experience initiating, conducting, and interpreting and presenting rigorous and reproducible biomedical research with increasing self-direction. And the ability to work effectively in teams with colleagues from a variety of cultural and scientific backgrounds and to promote inclusive and supportive scientific research environments. We also think it's important to teach um, communication skills um, and uh, research methodology, methodologies and be able to communicate to a wide variety of audiences. This can range from discipline specific across disciplines and also the general public. Um, uh, that we want to see the knowledge and professional skills and experiences that are required to identify careers in the biomedical research workforce and um, the ability to tr transition successfully. So that's that's kind of concludes the, the big picture overview of some of the things that we're trying to achieve with these funding announcements. And now we're going to get into really some of the practical aspects of the application. The first may be whether you're trying to decide whether NIGMS is a good fit. Um, and we have several um, scientific areas. Uh, they're listed here. We have 12 different areas um, ranging you can um, see the, the broad breadth um, of research training that we support. Um, when it comes time to, and just one other note, is that um, we allow one training grant in each of these areas um, per institution. So you need to work together at your institution um, if, if there are multiple people thinking of um, a, a particular area. And um, also you need to identify, put uh, an indication in the application um, which training area that you're um, writing the application for. And that goes specifically in the form under the AG, agency routing identifier portion of the application. So in terms of the application itself, here are some useful websites. I won't go through them, um, but they include just basic information, frequently asked questions, how to contact the staff um, in general. So some general tips, I'm sure you've heard this a million times, but it's really important to follow the instructions in the funding announcement and any notices that um, are associated with them, those notices appear at the top of the funding announcement. Um, and also this is, you, you make the application in conjunction with the SF424 application guide. There are three options to submit, grants.gov, um, NIH Assist, and your system to system if your institution has one. One thing we wanna make very clear is that the majority, if not all of the ones coming in are going to be considered new applications. And a definition of a new application for us is the obvious one, if your institution has never had a training grant in a particular area. Um, but also we're considering previously funded programs um, that came in under a parent announcement. So I've listed the ones that are um, our various uh, currently funded programs are here. Um, the only time you will be considered a renewal is if you had a, a training program that was funded under the, the, the um, previous funding announcement to the one we have now, and that's the PAR 17341. We don't anticipate that anybody's coming in for a renewal. It would be extremely early to come in, but um, we just wanted to make you aware of these, this distinction. As I mentioned, um, you'll need to use the um, application guide. There has been a forms change. Um, we now require forms F. So if you came in previously and are resubmitting, please note that there are new forms and new training tables um, associated with that. Um, 
so you should also check the FOA for any other kind of um, additional items, including um, page limits that are specified in the funding announcement. And you should know that if there's ever a, what you perceive as a discrepancy between the um, application guide and the funding announcement, the funding announcement supersedes um, the guide. So, um, so just wanted to make that clear. So when, as you um, put your application together, you're going to need, there is the, the main training plan, but there are also a lot of other items and I wanted to go through just a few of them. One is um, the project summary and abstract. Um, there's also a number of required and optional um, attachments. And I'm just gonna go through those quickly now. Um, the first is the advisory committee. If you don't have one, you should just describe what types of people you plan to bring to the advisory council. If you have a pre-existing advisory council, please list those names so we can take care of any conflicts um, in the review process. Um, there's also now a required attachment for application and admissions data. Um, we provide a suggested format. This is to replace um, a table that we have, um, we are no longer requiring, which is table 6A. There's a recruitment plan to enhance diversity, a trainee retention plan, outcome data collection and storage plan, and dissemination plans. And in the next few slides, I'll give you a little bit of information about these various attachments. So the first one that's required is the application and admissions data. Um, we give you a recommended format um, just to try to help you with the process. And um, it's different formats depending whether your program is contained within a single department or if it's interdisciplinary. And we have on our webpage different forms for you um, to take a look at. We have some with examples and some that are just blank um, that you can fill in. So what we're looking for here is application data regarding um, who applied, who you made offers to, and who ultimately um, joined the program. And we, what we want to see is the demographic data for these three groups. Um, and so that's, that's, the, that's the long and short of the data that we're asking. The data is required. The format that you choose is up to you, but we would recommend using the formats in the suggested formats. We also have a separate recruitment plan to enhance diversity. Because we feel diversity is so important, it, it has a separate section where you can specifically lay out your plans to enhance diversity. This can go hand in hand with your application data where you may see that there are certain um, uh, uh, groups of individuals you'd like to specifically reach out to because of um, your applicant pool. Um, so you should describe your strategies to recruit um, students from underrepresented groups. And um, there is a new um, uh, notice of interest in diversity just as examples of the type of um, diversity that NIH has, has highlighted as being nationally underrepresented. Um, you should talk about specific efforts your training program takes um, and uh, you want to see involvement of program faculty. Centralized institutional recruitment efforts are not going to be enough. Um, and then just want to make one note to note that just accommodations for pe persons with disabilities is not the same as outreach or um, recruitment. And we have listed, um, we have a web page where there are potential effective strategies that have been uh, useful in the past for other training programs, and those are available on our web page. We also want to see a trainee retention plan, and this should be retention of all trainees from all backgrounds. Um, and how are you going to sustain the interests of um, the scientists to um, continue to uh, stay in the program and earn the PhD? Um, so you should describe the specific efforts that are being done and uh, we want to see involvement of the training faculty and again as before centralized retention efforts alone are not sufficient and once again we do provide um, some helpful resources that might be of use to you as you craft your plan. This is a new attachment the outcome data collection and storage plan um, if you've applied under um, a PAR 17341, this was not required. This is now required because we think um, outcome analyses and assessment is so important. We wanna have a place for you to specifically discuss how you're going to track um, the students and how you're going to um, store the aggregate data um, onto um, centrally available and protected sites within the institution. 
we really care that the data are um, secure and stored um, with um, privacy considerations and um, they're centralized and safeguarded and they can be retrievable, particularly during um, leadership changes. There's also a required dissemination plan. Um, we wanna see what plans there are to publish or present nationally any findings um, or materials that are developed under the program. Um, and some of these examples would include um, data or materials from successful training or mentoring interventions. Um, you can do this by web postings, presentations at meetings um, or workshops. So the next part of the um, application that is um, really FOA specific is the training program. And we wanna be clear that you should follow the funding announcement and not the application guide for the training program. One of the things that we ask for is the rationale, mission and objectives. As I mentioned before, you really wanna have specific aims. Um, so we wanna see a strong justification for the program and this requires um, bringing uh, in data to show that you have the sufficient pool and the faculty um, to support this kind of training. As I mentioned before, um, you wanna see a, a training specific mission and objectives and these should be um, specific and measurable. So another part that's new with this particular funding announcement is that there is a separate section for the curriculum and overall training plan. Um, and there's a lot of uh, bits and pieces to this. And, I, and as you know, this is sort of the heart and soul of the um, training program. So we wanna make sure that you, you pay a lot of um, attention to this part. So you should describe how the courses and structured activities and the research experiences will accomplish your training goals. Um, so we want to see any changes that you're implementing to keep pace with the rapid changes in the biomedical research enterprise. Um, we want to see that there are mechanisms to ensure that the trainees are learning using the highest standards of practice, for example, in record keeping and safety. And this is important so that they can um, have the skills that they need to transition to the next steps um, in a, a range of careers. We wanna see how laboratory safety is taught throughout the didactic and mentored portions of the program. It should be embedded within, as we mentioned, there should be a culture of safety um, that is um, being catalyzed by the training program. Um, we wanna see evidence-informed approaches to trainee learning, mentorship, and inclusion and professional development. So it's, it's really, um, there's a lot of wonderful data out there and people are, are doing research on these topics about how people think and learn and we want to make sure that our training programs are on the cutting edge of what we know about educational practices. Um, we also want the one of the real goals is to bring build a strong cohort of resource research oriented individuals um, and and by this you want to see that you're enhancing their science identity their self-efficacy and the sense of belonging um, through the the cohort members. Um, we also want to see representative examples. No two programs are alike, so we really want to see what it what it looks like um, in terms of a, of a trainee going through your, your program. Um, we also want to see how you're going to accommodate differences um, in backgrounds. As we mentioned, it's inter interdisciplinary. People are coming from different backgrounds, and how will you accommodate these differences? Um, we also really want to, we want to be clear that these programs should have a, a, a broader effect than just affecting the trainees who are getting financial support. We re want to see that there's a much larger impact of the um, training program on the departments and the institutions. Um, if you have multidisciplinary or uh, multi-departmental programs, you should indicate um, how well they're integrated and coordinated and make a coherent plan. What we really don't want to see is just disparate different um, training happening. There should be a coherent um, training that is, is unique to this interdisciplinary experience. Um, we always want to see how your training program is distinct from other training programs at the institution, um, but at the same time, we would encourage you to share resources and synergize on things that you can um, uh, collaborate on. So there's a lot of professional development, career development activities that can be done um, as a group effort, but obviously the scientific training, the research, scientific research area would be unique to your program. As I mentioned before, we want to um, see career uh, development as a part of the, of the program. You wanna provide information regarding the variety of careers that are out there. 
Um, you want to engage a range of potential employers to make sure that the trainees are getting the requisite skills they need. Um, and then giving time to do exper experiential learning. Um, this could include internships, shadowing, um, informational interviews, teaching opportunities, for example. And we really want to see that you are posting the outcomes of the training program. So where did your trainees go on? What, what fields um, of, of research or, or what part of the biomedical research enterprise are they in? And this is, helps with transparency and the students can see what kinds of paths that they can take in the future. We have a strong commitment to making sure there's programmatic oversight. Um, we, have a, we also think that it, the faculty should be carefully selected and that there should be um, mentor training. So, as I mentioned, oversight is essential um, for, for these training programs. We want to make sure the faculty are selected based on a commitment to training and mentoring. Um, we want to ensure that the program should ensure that the trainees are in research environments that promote responsible conduct as well as rigor and transparency. Um, and then there should be a, a, a large degree of providing mentor training for the participating faculty and a mechanism to ensure that there's an appropriate match between the mentors and the mentees. Um, and then there should be plans for removing faculty that show poor mentorship qualities from the program and just, you know, build it in that there's assumptions that this could happen and, and what will the program do to um, remove the faculty from these programs. Um, we also want to ensure that the faculty are actively participating in career advising, for example, using um, individual development plans and, and discussing those with their students. As I mentioned before, we want to see a strong institutional commitment um, to the program, and um, this comes in the form of a 10-page letter that is um, uploaded to the Letters of Support section. This is a required document. Um, also, another place to talk about institutional commitment and, and the general resources available can be discussed in facilities and other resources section. So between these two places, you're going to get a pretty good picture of the institutional commitment and resources. Um, but if there's any other additional information, um, you can put it in this section of the training plan. But we ask that you please don't repeat any information that is um, contained elsewhere in the application. So as far as this 10 page letter goes, there's a lot <laughs> of things that are um, examples of institutional commitment. And this includes developing and promoting a culture where the highest standards of safety, scientific rigor, reproducibility, and the responsible conduct of research are advanced. Um, also, this could include uh, ensuring sufficient startup funds for early stage faculty and bridging funds for um, fa uh, training faculty who may have a gap in funding so that we ensure that that there are no um, barriers to the trainees finishing their their research training um, also we want to see support of core facilities technology resources um, and anything that may be enhancing the research training we want to see adequate staff facilities and educational resources are devoted to the program that there is support of the program directors and other key staff associated with the training programs. Um, and we want to see that there is a um, general fostering and rewarding excellence in training and this can be through policies such as ten tenure and promotion that it's recognized as a, a, a and the institution values training and mentoring. Um, as I mentioned before, that there are structures in place to remove um, participating faculty from the program that are um, poorly performing mentors, and it probably goes without saying that anybody who is under investigation for um, any kind of uh, harassment charges. Um, we also want to see a commitment at the institutional level to diversity, equity, and inclusion at all levels uh, of the research training environment, and this goes from the trainees all the way to um, institutional leaders. And we want to ensure that they are thinking about creating positive, well, that they are, are taking steps to ensure a positive, supportive, and inclusive research um, and training environment for individuals from all backgrounds. As a continuation of this 10-page letter, um, ensure that there are research facilities to promote um, excellence in training and that promote the safety of the individuals. Um, and guaranteeing that these facilities are accessible to trainees with disabilities. Um, there's language and we want to see that there are um, proper procedures, policies in place to prevent discriminatory harassment and other practices. 
and to appropriately respond to allegations um, of such um, discriminatory practices. And this includes uh, notifying NIH um, and requesting a change of PDPI status, um, and as we mentioned before, um, removing um, participating faculty from the uh, training program. Providing trainees across, um, uh, providing trainees access, excuse me, to student support services, and these include healthcare, counseling services, and housing. Um, ensuring that the trainees will be supported throughout the time um, that they are in their, the program from the day they matriculate to when they earn their PhD so that there are no um, gaps in their financial support. Um, we want to make sure that the institution is committed to providing resources and expertise for evaluating the training outcomes. Um, and if there are multiple um, pre-doctoral NIGMS uh, pre-doctoral training programs, it should explain um, the synergies and how there is not overlap um, in the, the various programs. Um, now we're moving on to the program director's principal investigators. Um, we obviously want to see that there's the appropriate scientific expertise, um, but uh, also that they have administrative um, capabilities and experience with training. Again, we want to see sufficient bandwidth to make sure um, that they have the, um, the time and um, energy to commit to the training program. They should have a, a record of rigorous and uh, using rigorous and transparent methods um, in experimental design, data collection, analysis, and reporting. Um, that they show a strong commitment to training uh, the next generation of biomedical uh, scientists. Um, and that they themselves have received uh, training to mentor individuals from a, a diverse um, array of backgrounds. We actually encourage a multi-PI model um, so that there can be um, complementary expertise. You might have um, a person with a scientific focus, but you might also have um, a social scientist who might help with um, some aspects of um, the evaluation of the program. And you may have for example, um, an institutional leader who can help bring about institutional changes. So those are just some examples, but you can have a, a broad um, team with complementary um, expertise. We want to see that what the administrative structure is and if, um, what the succession plan is um, for any critical positions in the training program. As far as the preceptors mentors go, or this is also known as the program faculty, um, we want to see that you have a diverse team, and this includes, examples include um, those from underrepresented backgrounds, women, faculty at different career stages. And we want to see that um, the team that's coming together are individuals who have sufficient time to commit to the training, um, given their other obligations, that they've received um, tra training in effective, evidence-informed um, teaching and mentoring practices, that they themselves promote the use of the higher, highest standards of practice that ensure safety of individuals in the research environment, that they as a team cooperate, interact, and collaborate, um, that they promote the development of trainee skills um, in approaches to rigorous experimental design, methods of data collection, data analysis, and interpretation and reporting. Um, and that they provide opportunities for trainees to initiate, conduct, interpret, and pre present rigorous, reproducible, responsible biomedical research with the goal of them becoming incre increasingly self-directed. Um, so we want to see a, a commitment to effective mentoring and to promoting inclusive, safe, and supportive um, scientific and training environments. And finally, that they're in some way evaluated as their effectiveness as teachers and mentors. Um, that we want to make sure that that component of their skill set is also evaluated. As I mentioned, um, there's a little bit of difference in this funding announcement with the application and admission data. Um, so instead of Table 6A, which many of the applicants found to be um, highly burdensome and time consuming, we have eliminated Table 6A, but there was some useful information in there. And we're now asking for that data, as I mentioned, in a required um, attachment. And here's the type of things we're looking for. So as I mentioned before, we wanna see data, the demographic data on those who were admitted, uh, who, who applied, who were admitted, and who matriculated into the program. Um, we also want uh, to expand upon but not duplicate the information in the recruitment plan to enhance diversity to explain how you are going to ensure to have a, 
a diverse pool of applicants um, who, with the, who have the potential to strongly benefit from the program and with the proper training and support, they can succeed in the program. We're also encouraging a more holistic approach to candidate review. This is a process that considers the entire application and it goes beyond um, some of the standard metrics um, you know, that are typically looked at, such as uh, grade point average, the undergraduate institution and standardized tests. So we want to see um, taking, to just taking a more um, comprehensive uh, view of the application process. Um, if the program participants are drawn from multiple departments, um, describe how the PDs and PIs will ensure that those departments also have holistic approaches. Um, so we really want to exert a broad influence on how um, applications are reviewed. Um, if the training program that you're writing the application for does not conduct any of its own recruitment and admissions, um, and instead you appoint students who have already been admitted, you have to provide a strong um, rationale or justification for taking this approach because we really think you know that's a that's a key part of um, ensuring that um, that appropriate practices are being used in the um, admission process. Trainee trainee positions um, all must be highly justified, and what we want to see is how large you know the way the way we get a sense of this is how large is the whole program and what percentage of those. Um, students are being supported on the training grant. There's an expectation that there is institutional support and that NIGMS is not supporting um, the, is not supporting all of the, um, the students in the program. So you need to provide a strong justification um, and this is in the context of, of who the training eligible pool, the size of the program, and the number of participating um, faculties, as well as other funded training programs at the institution. Um, so you should also explain the support structure. This includes how many individuals, for example, four per year, and at what stage, for example, the first year entrance, for how long, one year, two year. Um, and I just want to point out that NIGMS typically funds trainees for one to two years during the first one to three years of the PhD program except under exceptional circumstances. Um, you need to define and justify the selection and reappointment criteria. And we have a, a, an appendix that um, you, you can, um, where you include the trainee appointment procedures. Um, retention and support. Um, there is a section for the trainee retention plan, and this part of it is just to provide any evidence of its commitment to ensuring the well being and success of trainees um, throughout their entire uh, graduate training experience. Um, describe the ability of the participating departments and institutions to support the trainees for the duration of their graduate careers. Um, so, this is a key part of, um, of making sure that you're retaining the students and you're providing for them across their entire time. Um, so trainee outcomes, uh, this is a place for you to use the required NIH tables, except for table 6A. Um, and you want to make sure that the data that you put in the table closely matches um, the narrative. There should be no discrepancies between um, the training tables and, and what you're, you're describing in the application itself. Um, so what we want to see is evidence that um, they have the, the the trainees have conducted rigorous research that has advanced scientific knowledge or technologies, that they did this with increasing self-direction, and you can um, include peer-reviewed publications or other measures of scientific accomplishment that may be appropriate to uh, your field. We want to see the PhD degree attainment and time to degree for recent graduates. Please explain to us how you calculate that time to degree. It's quite variable depending um, on whether it's um, the moment they come into the program to the moment they earn their PhD, um, there can be some variability. So we appreciate you explaining how you calculated it. Um, we also want to see how many individuals obtained a PhD degree, how many are still in training, and how many left uh, with a master's degree, and who withdrew from the program with no degree. Um, so and the other thing that we want to do is for you to compare these outcome data for well-represented um, trainees and underrepresented uh, trainees. We want to see things like peer-reviewed publications and other measures of scientific accomplishment, time to degree, um, that, they, that 
to compare well-represented and underrepresented groups. Um, and we obviously want to see training outcomes, and this is in um, the training table 8A, and this uh, says how successful the, the alums were in transitioning to careers in the biomedical research workforce. As I mentioned, we have a strong emphasis on program evaluation and dissemination. Um, we expect uh, to conduct ongoing evaluations uh, to monitor the success, and it should describe the evaluation or assessment process. Um, it should be very much aligned with the specific um, goals and objectives of the, or the mission and objectives of the program. Um, and also we wanna see that, that what, what have they done to, what have you done to determine whether their scientific research climate is inclusive, safe, and supportive of uh, trainee development. Also wanna see plans for being responsive to outcome analyses, critiques, surveys, and evaluations. Um, of course, to, uh, to track past activities and post-career outcomes of the trainees. Um, so you can expand upon what you have in the outcome data collection storage plan. Um, again, don't duplicate information, but you can um, discuss in a broad sense in this part of the application. Um, and also describe any past activities um, that you, where you have shared the outcomes of the training or mentoring interventions with the broader com community. There's also, so that sort of, that takes us through the um, training plan. And as I mentioned, please closely follow the funding announcement um, and don't, in this part, do not follow that um, application guide. There is now, a, there's a separate section for the plan for the instruction for the responsible conduct of research. This is three pages. Um, and what we wanna see at NIGMS is that these components are well integrated into the overall curriculum at multiple stages of training development. Um, we also want to see how RCR, the rigor, um, Responsible Conduct of Research, synergizes um, with uh, the plans to, um, to teach about rigorous and reproducible research. We want program faculty to be, to be heavily involved and see how they reiterate and augment the key elements of the Responsible Conduct of Research. Um, and we have some resources here. There's the, the responsible conduct for research policy um, notices that we put there. And also there are some resources to help you put your plans together. There is also a plan for instruction in methods for enhancing reproducibility. This is also a three page plan. And you should know for the NIGMS funding announcement, this is a scored part of the scored application. Um, so you should describe how they're going to be instructed in the pr principles important for enhancing research repro reproducibility. Um, and this includes a number of, you know, specific areas that NIH has identified as being important for enhancing reproducibility. Um, you should describe how the instruction strategies, once again, are well integrated into the overall curriculum and how they're taught at multiple stages of the development in a variety of formats and contexts. So we don't want this to be a one-off. We want it to be just thoroughly embedded into um, the training plan. Um, and again, we want faculty involvement, really key to, to have faculty engaged in this and how they'll reiterate and augment the key elements um, in their own research labs. We had several resources. We've, we've supported um, supplements to our training programs that are in the area of rigor and reproducibility. We have a clearinghouse with, for, with, that has training modules that are available to you in the community that you can um, slot into some of your um, existing courses. And um, there's a website that describes um, issues around rigor and reproducibility at NIH. So I'm going to mention the progress report for the renewal. It's part of the funding announcement. I don't anticipate that any of you will be um, writing this progress report, but the reason for putting it here, and I'm not going to read all the points point by point, but to see that you should be keeping a view to what you're going to have to do when you come back in for renewal. And you're gonna see that we really want it, we're gonna sort of hold people to their program goals and make sure that they achieved the things that they said they were going to achieve in the previous um, round. So I'm not gonna go through them here, but they do echo many of the components I've just gone through in, in quite a bit of detail. And you can see that we're asking um, for quite a few bullet points. So it's worth taking a look at these so that you're prepared for the future. 
And again, this is, as you can see, we want to see a lot of things. So I think it's always good to know what's expected of you coming up. And so please just take a look at that, but know that, that there is a chance, not, not many, no, it's very unlikely that any of you are putting in renewals right now. Another important part of the application are the faculty bio sketches. And one of the reasons is that we really are asking them to write a personal statement that describes the appropriateness of their, both their research background, um, but also their commitment to training, mentoring, and promoting inclusive and safe um, and supportive research environments. Um, that they are committed also to teaching trainees to conduct ethically sound and responsible um, scientific research that they have a record of providing training in rigorous and unbiased experimental design, methodology, analysis, interpretation, and the reporting of results. And that they themselves promote the use of the highest standard of practice um, to ensure the safety of individuals in the research environment. Um, so we also wanna make sure that they are committed to supporting trainees and activities that are required for them to transition to um, the next stage in the biomedical research workforce, and that they are really in tune to what is um, in the, the trainees' um, best interest and their values and um, the skills that they have. And that um, they are also committed to fulfilling the needs of their trainees to complete their PhD in a timely fashion with all the skills that they need um, to, to go on to the next step. So other required components just to go through, I've mentioned the mandatory institutional letter at some length, it's a 10 page letter, it, it must be part of the application. Uh, um, another required component is all of the uh, training data tables. They're listed here, please note that table 6A has been eliminated. Um, Stephanie uh, Constant is gonna talk about that a little more and the consequences um, of, of having it in there. Um, uh, there are quite a bit of instructions on how to fill out the tables. There are frequently asked questions. For those of you who are using Xtrain and Extract, there are user guides and um, videos and tutorials that they help you with that process. Um, there are appendices. We have required appendices and allowable ones. The required ones, the first and foremost, we wanna see the training activities that are requirements of the training program. We wanna see the, um, the syllabi from those activities or the, or the, um, the workshop descriptions or whatever, it is, whatever is required, we wanna see that um, appendix. We also wanna see the, um, the syllabi for the responsible conduct of research. And as I mentioned before, the trainee appointment procedures. There are three allowable, um, they're not required, but they're allowed. One is if you wanna describe up to four extra elective activities, so four total um, elective activities that, that the trainees may um, take. Uh, if you wanna provide any blank, uh, not filled out, but blank evaluation um, and assessment instruments, um, and as well, if, if you have conflict resolution protocols, um, you can include them in an, in an allowable appendix. So dates to remember, um, if there are three receipts dates a year, May, September, and January. Um, as always, we encourage you to submit early um, so that you can catch missing components or uh, correct errors. Um, so please uh, <laughs> submit early and um, it, you really avoid having to get bounced to the, to the next round. So the peer review happens in fall, winter, and summer, so those corresponding dates. Um, so we have these coming to each of our um, three councils per year, but um, all of the receipt dates are once a year and that's um, in July. All right, so um, it is my great pleasure to pass it over to Stephanie. I'm really happy to not be talking <laughs> anymore. That was a lot to bring in and, and um, I'm passing it on to Stephanie now. All right, thank you, Alison. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Stephanie Constant. I'm the review chief at NIGMS. Um, so I'm just going to give you some information about the review process for these applications, a few reminders for when you're writing your application, and also um, some lessons learned uh, from the review, the reviews that we've had to date for the first version of this BOA, uh, since I think this could be helpful also for when you are planning your own application. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with how we review these, we have two standing panels that review all our T32s, uh, TWDA and B. Uh, each one is made up of 21 members. Uh, all of them have strong expertise in graduate training, 
uh, the required diversity, gender distribution, as well as geography. Uh, and when needed, if we get a lot of applications, we supplement um, with temporary members. And uh, the, the names of the SROs that run each of these um, committees is listed there and you are welcome to contact them with any questions. Next, please, Alison. Uh, when we uh, came up with the new T32 FOA a few years back, um, we did uh, make a point of expanding the expertise on these committees. We now include um, individuals that have uh, expertise in evaluation and outcome analysis, uh, career outcomes in graduate education, as well as training in multiple career paths. And we changed uh, the membership so that it is initially a two-year membership, um, which allows us to uh, move different expertises in and out as needed, uh, although in most cases we do renew the membership for a, an additional two years for most people. Just so you know, the A and B committees are considered sister committees, um, so they have the same expertise in both, and we make a point of um, jointly orienting the reviewers in the two committees, so they, they have the same orientation at the same time as a means of ensuring consistency across the two panels. Uh, and if you're interested, I put links to each of the rosters for the two committees at the bottom. Next, please. Awesome. Um, for those of you who, again, may have had a previous uh, T32 program at NIGMS, you will probably know that we used to do um, site visits as part of the peer review. We recently retired peer review site visits. Uh, Alison and I wrote a, um, a feedback loop post on this. Uh, but one thing I want to emphasize is now there are no more site visits, it's very, very important that you include all the information that is going to be needed for the reviewers um, within the application. So there's no way of adding any more information um, as part of a, a site visit. So please be sure everything is in your application. Next, please. Um, importantly, um, the review criteria are what the uh, reviewers are using when they're considering your uh, application. So please be sure to, to look at these and read them as you are writing uh, your application. So you are addressing everything that the reviewers need to evaluate. Ultimately, what they're going to be looking for is that as part of their overall impact is the likelihood that your proposed training program is gonna produce that diverse pool of well-trained scientists and that they're gonna be able to conduct rigorous reproducible research and have the capacity to transition into careers in the biomedical research workforce. Next, please, Alison. Um, so we have different types of scored of review criteria. Uh, the first one is the scored review criteria. There are five different categories, training program and environment, pr program directors, mentors, application process, uh, and training record. And you will see within these five um, criteria, there are different elements. Each of these needs to be addressed. Um, and importantly, because these are scored review criteria, uh, they, in, they will individually get scored and will be very carefully scrutinized uh, as part of the review. Uh, next, please. Uh, the second category of criteria are called additional review criteria. They don't get an individual score, but they actually contribute to the overall final score um, of the program. Um, in this case, we, the main one is the, tr is the new training and methods for enhancing reproducibility, which is a plan. And reviewers are asked to um, judge it as being acceptable, yes, yes or no. But importantly, it is factored into the final score. So it's very, very important that this is, this is well addressed. Um, the final section is the additional review considerations. This is discussed after the final scoring. Um, and so there are three different elements here to address the recruitment plan to enhance, enhance diversity, which is a plan. Reviewers are asked whether it's acceptable or not. Training in the responsible conduct of research, which is another plan, acceptable, yes or no. And then finally, the budget and period of support. Uh, next, please. As a reminder, the training data tables, as Alison mentioned, um, we no longer require table 6A. However, all applications do need to have all of the other tables. And what I've done is highlighted some language taken from, from the FOA for different sections. And this, I call this my judge dread um, mm -hmm. <laughs> highlight because it's a way of reminding you that if you're missing any of these tables, either that or that you put in any tables that are not supposed to be there, your application will be considered non-compliant and will not be reviewed. 
So please, please be sure you have all these tables. Unfortunately, my office is the one that has to do the withdrawals and, and notify you that your application is not going to be reviewed. So please be sure everything is there and that you don't add anything that should not be there. You may include additional data tables, but it has to be uh, within the text um, of the application. Um, so just be sure again, if you have additional tables, put them in the text, do not put them in the training data table section. And if you are gonna have some additional tables, please label them A through Z instead of one through eight <laughs> to avoid confusion. Next. There are several other attachments. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but again, it's very important because they are required, especially the required ones. Uh, if they are missing, your application will be considered incomplete and will not be reviewed. Next. Next slide. Oh, okay, sorry. The institutional letter of support, as Alison mentioned, it is required. It is, it's complicated. It's a maximum of 10 pages please be sure all the requested information is in that one letter. It cannot be distributed across several letters by different authors. If there are multiple deans involved, they should all sign that one single letter. And please be sure to include uh, any new language. Uh, in particular, we, we highlight the, the discriminatory harassment and other discriminatory practices. Um, again, if this letter is missing, your application will be in considered incomplete and will not be reviewed. You are permitted to have some additional letters of support. There's no page limits for that. Um, uh, but be sure that they don't contain any information that's supposed to be in this uh, required institutional letter of support. Next. <laughs> Appendix materials, everybody's favorite section. <laughs> So um, there are several allowable appendix materials. Uh, the one that, that is allowed for all FOAs is blank data collection forms, blank informed consent forms, uh, interview questions. Be sure they are blank. Don't include anything as an example of how you would fill them in because that is not allowed. They really, really have to be blank. Um, for this particular, for our particular T32 FOA, again, there are some required um, sections. Um, make sure they're all there. There are some allowable ones. If any of the required ones are missing, again, your application will not, be, will not go to review. It will be withdrawn. Uh, next, please. So now I thought I would just tell you a little bit about some of um, some challenges that reviewers have had. And this is a way to kind of emphasize things you really need to be careful of and mindful of when you're preparing your application. Um, the rigor and reproducibility and the responsible conduct of research really, really needs to be integrated throughout your application. It's not sufficient to just describe it in the two training plans. Those two training plans are required, but that's, that's not enough. You really have to sort of have everything really carefully throughout the application and reviews are going to be really, really looking for this. Enhancing diversity applies both to trainees and to mentors within the application. Again, it's not sufficient to just describe it in a plan. It really has to be integrated throughout the whole application. And, and if there are deficiencies, if, if your diversity isn't very strong in one or the other um, groups, then be upfront about it and describe how you're going to address it. I, I think reviewers get frustrated when people try and hide things. Um, it's much better to just say, this is what we're struggling with, and this is, this is a plan that we, we're going to use uh, and put in place in order to improve, um, improve our diversity. Innovation overlap with other T32 programs. What is unique about your program relative to other training programs? How will this contribute to your field and your graduates in particular? Uh, we really, again, it can't just be a generic program. Uh, it needs to be something that's really going to do something special for, for your graduates. Um, also, if you've had a long, previously had a long-standing program, uh, it's really, you should consider including a leadership transition plan. Uh, there's always a concern if somebody's been a, 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 the, the director of a program for, for many, many years, decades, um, are you going to bring in somebody new and start training them and kind of eventually let them take over uh, when you decide you no longer want to continue uh, running this program? Next slide, please, Alison. 
So the evaluation component, sometimes reviewers feel it's not well designed, it's limited. Um, one thing to bear in mind is there's not a one size fit, fits all for evaluations. Just make sure you write a, a, a plan that measures the goals of your particular program. It does not have to be something that's, that's kind of comparable across many different types of programs. What is it that you think is important to measure and what are the metrics you are going to use and discuss both short and long-term evaluation goals. Make sure that the, everything that needs to be addressed in the institutional letter is there. Reviewers really scrutinize that letter and, and they, will, they will notice if something is missing. So please uh, be sure everything is in there. Uh, often we see bias sketches where the personal statement is missing. This is the statement committing to mentoring. Uh, just make sure everybody, each of your faculty has included that mentoring statement. And you really need to justify the number of trainee slots requested, especially if you've had a previous program where you had a very high number uh, of trainees. That's not sufficient to just say this is what I had previously. Um, you really need to justify why you feel your program can support as many trainees. Describe your pool of training grant eligible students, the resources and mentors that you're going to have available. And, and be very careful that you anything that's outside of NIGMS guidelines. I mean, for us, this is we like to see training in the early years, uh, and no more than two years of funding for each trainee. If you're going to go outside of that, it has to be really, really well justified. Um, I think that's it for me. So um, I'm, I'll be here to answer questions and I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm going to go over just a uh, few points about the application budget. In the FOA, there will be a, but, a button that leads you to the 424 application kit. And that will bring up specific instructions for training grants. Once you click on that, it will provide you specific forms that you need to use. So uh, when you're filling out the uh, training budget, uh, it will instruct you to use the PHS 398 training budget form. This looks very different than the budget form that you use for an R01. And it's very important that you use the correct one. Um, Allison, I think you had to click on, there you go. So let's go over some of the specific um, costs that you can request. Uh, when you um, submit um, your request for stipends, you'll use whatever is the current uh, NIH published um, guideline for NRSA stipend levels for that year. Um, so you don't have to worry if you're submitting it with a previous year's, if by the time your grant is funded, um, you've used something that's outdated, that doesn't um, need to concern you because when the grants management specialist works up your budget for the award, we will use the most current stipend levels. Um, you'll also have an opportunity to request tuition and fees. Um, you should request the full um, tuition and fees that your institution charges. You don't want to apply the NIH formula. Uh, we've seen many times where the grantee is um, trying to do us a favor in applying the NIH formula to their tuition. And when the specialist reviews your budget in the application, they won't realize that and they will apply the formula again. So that will mean you will get an award with uh, double cuts. So please just request whatever your actual tuition and fees are um, for that year. And uh, travel is um, uh, a formula based for NIGMS. We pay $300 per trainees for pre-docs and $500 per trainees for post-docs. But you have to request at least the $300 per trainees. If you request less, we can't give you more. Uh, but to be on the safe side, you may just want to request whatever travel you want for your individual um, trainees and then we'll cut it down to the 300 but it does have to be at least the minimum of 300. 
You can also request training related expenses. That is a lump sum that's also published in the annual uh, NRSA stipend chart uh, put out by NIH, which includes stipends and the training related expenses. And that's a lump sum amount that varies every year. This year, I think it's like 11,000 11, something, I'm not sure. But um, under that, um, you can charge your health insurance, um, any staff salaries that are directly related to the training grant, uh, materials, equipment. It's just kind of a catch all for any expenses that are directly related to your training program. And then of course you have your indirect costs, which for training grants is capped at 8% modified total direct cost. I think that is everything. And I think we're gonna open up the floor to questions now. Great, thanks. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, please send your questions in the chat box. I have tried to answer uh, quite a few already, uh, but I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Sidella Blatch to call out the questions, and then either Alison or I will, will answer it. If it's a programmatic question, if it's a review, then Stephanie, I'll invite in Stephanie to answer and, and I don't have to invite. If it sounds like a review, Stephanie, jump in. And same thing with Lisa. So, Saidella. Great, thank you to all the presenters so far. We do have a lot of questions, so we'll, we'll do our best to get to what we can. So would there be any application data that would be included for a degree program applied to from outside of the university or would it only be to the T32 supported program, which may draw students from multiple PhD programs? Alison, you want to take that or do you want me to take that? <laughs> I'm not 100% sure I understood the question, but um, I think one of the things that, that we're trying to do is to encourage um, taking a more holistic approach to the application process. And we're trying to exert as much of a, an impact as possible. So any students that you're drawing from, it would be important to say what type of application process that they are using. Um, and then if you are, if you're drawing from different places, what is it, then what is your decision making process and how you select the students to be appointed specifically to the program. Um, the idea here is that just, you know, a lot of data has shown that when people take a more holistic approach, to the application process, the um, invited students tend to be more um, diverse. And so this is just one of the things we're trying to encourage and we want to exert a, a larger effect, um, as, as large effect as possible. I hope that answered it. <laughs> okay, thank you. So there were several questions about recruitment and retention. So I'm gonna, they, and, and many of them were related to each other. So I'm, I'm just gonna sort of read a few of them and, and hopefully you all can kind of address the various points uh, connected there. So um, there were concerns because some universities either don't allow um, the required collection of student data on disability status, URM status, disadvantaged status, um, or some universities don't have that data for other reasons, students may not disclose. So how would, so one part of the question is how would we get the, how is the data, to get the data for the tables? And related to that is how to recruit these students if it's not known what their status would be. And another related question is how would, um, how would, it, and increase in diversity of these students be measured over time without that data? So I see, John, you're here. Did you want to answer that? Yeah, maybe I can address some of that and then you can follow up. Yeah. The first point I want to make is that all demographic data are voluntary and self-reported. So I'm not exactly sure what the questioners are thinking the alternative is. I mean, no one is requiring uh, genetic testing data um, and, and that couldn't be done. So this is no different than a clinical study, right? Where the way you get demographic data is you ask the participants uh, for that data and they can give it to you or not. Um, 
so so I, I don't think saying that the data are useless because they are self-reported um, and voluntary is, is at all accurate. Um, that, that is what demographic data are um, in, in all situations. So that's the first point I would make. Um, in terms of how do you um, recruit, um, given that, that it's voluntary whether someone reports or not, um, for say a disability or for um, background, um, remember that now I'm speaking as a former um, admissions director for a graduate program, recruitment you know, has a spectrum of, of times. And I think what you wanna focus on um, particularly is recruitment as an outreach, right? Um, you know, there are uh, programs that, and there are universities that specifically focus on educating people with certain disabilities. Gallaudet University uh, here in DC, for example, with hearing impaired individuals. You could create a, you know, an outreach program and a recruitment program that's targeted to um, a university like that. We fund um, in, in Rochester uh, uh, bridges to uh, the doctorate, I think, program. Um, again, that's also focused on hearing impaired individuals. So um, when we're talking about recruitment, you know, that's what we're talking about. Start some major recruitment efforts that could be at universities uh, or colleges that have populations that would broaden the diversity of your program in various ways. Those could be Again, uh, schools like Gallaudet, they could be HBCUs or other minority serving institutions. Um, you know, that, that's certainly something we'd like to see. And I think that's the way to approach um, that particular issue. Allison, do you have anything to Yeah, add? no, those are great points. And I think one of the things that I would add to the part about admissions data. So if your institution is not collecting um, self-reported demographic data at the time of um, application, there is, is my understanding, there's no legal barrier to asking for self-reported and then also including consent language that says, you know, do you consent to use this, that this data be used in an a, a de-identified aggregated way? And that's all we're asking is de-identified aggregated um, data on admissions. And I think that the real, just to, to give you the, the rationale here, this is, it's, a, it's a game changer when you realize that you have no applicants from certain racial and ethnic groups, zero. <laughs> so then you know, then it can target your recruitment efforts to specific um, that you, you really need to get out there and um, recruit more. And John's points were great. We have a web page that's all about active recruitment. How, how, how can you engage with students from diverse backgrounds. And um, we have a number of diversity enhancing programs. You can form partnerships with those programs to, to develop, you know, to identify students who can transition into your program. So um, we're happy to talk to you specifically about strategies and, and ways to do this, but we really wanna bring institutions up to the level where they're collecting this data and paying attention to it because you can't act on something if you don't know where the problem is. So um, that's, that's the real goal for, we know that it's, we're asking a lot to go gather data, but there's a, there's a rationale behind it. And I just say, I'm certain that your universities um, are very focused on this themselves. If they're not at this stage of the game, I think you, know, you should be asking why not. Um, and I would encourage you to work with your broader universities in terms of the data collection efforts and you know, looking at demographic data, because I'm sure that the administration is, is focusing on this at your institution. Okay, thank you guys. So another, a question for the recruitment and retention plans, um, part of the application. So how would these two documents differ from the same sections of the program plan? So what we want to see in the plan is what, what is, what's the plan? You know, what are, what do you, what do you have on the books? What are you going to do? What events are you going to attend? What universities are you going to partner with? What, in diversity enhancing programs are you going to reach out to? What is your specific plan? When you're talking in the, in the, the training, in the narrative outside of the plan, it's what, what have been your successes and failures? Um, how, how do you um, support diversity efforts within the, um, the graduate training program? How do you make safe and inclusive environments? So, so just think of them as two different, one is like a, an action plan and that's, that's a strategy for recruitment. And the rest of it is just taking a, 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 a 
broader thinking approach to um, diversity at all levels. So at the at this, how do you get a more diverse student body, but how do you get a more diverse faculty administration, you know, much bigger picture um, action items for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and you can talk about successes and failures in the, in the training plan as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's also another sort of cluster of related questions. And these are about selecting trainees to a point and also in connection with activities that other trainees that are not a part of the program would participate in or benefit from. So one of the general questions is, what are the thoughts overall about who to appoint to, uh, in terms of trainees for this program? John, do you want to go first? Or? Well, I would, I would take the second part. I'll leave the who to appoint to you. But yeah. um, you know, the second part about do you want to see different activities for people in the T32 versus in the training program, the answer is no. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, we really you know, if you have a program and some subset of your students are on the T32 or supported by the T32 and another subset are supported by institutional funds or, or however you do it, we really want to see all those students getting the same experience um, and being given access to the same opportunities. We want the T32 programs and the T34 programs for that matter uh, for undergraduates um, to really be institutional enhancement um, vehicles. Um, and, and so the answer to your question is we do not want to see differences. We don't want a caste system. Uh, we really want it to float everybody up equally. Yeah, I, I just want to echo John's comments. Sometimes um, there's an interpretation that when we want to see what is distinct about that program, that that translates into kind of elite activities for the trainees. And that's, that's the last thing we want. We don't want to have a, the haves and the have nots. We really want to have you know, um, where, where students are not made to feel like they're outsiders if they're not on the training program. What we mean by distinct is what is your science, what's your goal, your scientific training goal? So if you are a, you know, if this is a biophysics program, what kind of skills do the biophysicists need and what knowledge do they need to, to so that's, that's unique to your program. But as far as um, training activities, anybody associated with that program, there should, it should be seamless. So I just, I'm just echoing what John just said. Um, in terms of who to appoint, I, I think that you, you, you know your students best and you know who will uh, potentially benefit from, and you know your structure, your financial structure at your institution. If being on a training grant will make a, a student make um, a student have more access to different labs that will really help their graduate career then you know think think in terms of what is best for the students and please don't think just in terms of who's going to have the stellar outcomes because the goal is to um, you know give give them training opportunities and to support a whole range of students and it's not just about selecting out the very best so you can show that you were successful. So please, please take a trainee focused approach as to who to, who to appoint to the, specifically to the training grant. Maybe I'll just add one thing too to that is um, in, in terms of special activities, you know, sometimes reviewers say things about what's unique about this, what are the special activities for the T32. Um, often what they're talking about is they don't wanna see the T32 being simply a vehicle for funding graduate students. Um, they want to see that it is actually enhancing the training environment in some particular area of science. Um, so if that's not clear in your application, that could be a problem. If it, if it seems to them that the only thing that the money is being used for and that the only thing the program, the T32 part of the program does is pay for students to be in labs, that's not going to go well because that's not what, what it's about. Stephanie, did you have any, since that's a review issue, any comment on that? I think you and Allison covered it. There's nothing to add. <clears throat> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, somewhat on that theme is a question about trainee outcomes. Is there any judgment on the percent of trainees that would complete a degree or how long they would take to complete the degree? So, for instance, if some URMs choose 
to stay longer? Is that going to be seen in a, in a poor light? Right. So no, I mean, I, you know, I can, you can never speak for reviewers and I, you know, I wouldn't pretend to, um, but um, the real, the real goal of, of comparing underrepresented and well-represented outcome data is to just look, just to make people take a moment to see, ooh, ooh maybe the publication records are, are not um, similar or they're just routinely a longer time to degree or uh, just, just some red flags that there are, are um, places where the program needs to intervene to make sure that all is well. So just taking time to degree, sometimes you know stuff happens and we all know that. Sometimes things, a person takes longer for whatever reason. I think that the great thing about the, the 25 pages is you have a chance to explain things. And um, sometimes it's, it's, it's the best thing for the student to let them have six more months to finish up a publication that really poises them well to get fellowships at the next stage or, you know, so if, as long as you are, there's oversight, you're paying attention, you're doing what's best for the student and, and what's, what's going to be good for their career and they're transitioning to the next step, just explain that. So, but a, a raw number with no explanation can be read negatively. But if you're saying, well, we have found that an extra six months has, has made, had this effect on our ability of our students to get certain postdocs or other um, career opportunities. That, that's something you, you, you can explain. What we want to do is just to make sure that you're paying attention and that, um, you know, I would say in particular the publication, there's data that um, students from underrepresented groups have um, differential publication um, records. And so this is something that we just want everybody to be aware of and focusing on and making sure that that there are not disparities there. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo what Alison says. It's important not to bury stuff. I mean, be upfront about it. And, and if you think it is a problem, say we, we acknowledge that we we're not doing so well in this area. And this is what we plan to do to help address it. So <clears throat> Thank you. Um, a question about evaluation. Um, so especially with respect to any differences in this FOA compared to the previous FOA, are there examples of types of internal and external evaluation or feedback that should be sought? Um, and in addition to that, um, if external evaluation is, is highly recommended, meaning done by external parties to the program, is there any sort of extra budgetary allowances for that? So, um, so you probably know, yeah, go ahead, Shiva, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we leave it up to you to decide what works best for you. If you want to do an external evaluation, that's your choice, but there is no extra money uh, provided for evaluation per se. What you have is the TRE, and I think right now it's 4,200. And so that, that expense has to come out. Uh, generally, uh, we have seen that, that institutions or the training programs have found somebody from their own institution, from the education uh, department or, or, or somebody uh, with expertise in evaluation that, that has been able to guide them uh, and that has worked well for them. Um, certainly, it's not our expectation that you'll hire a high-priced uh, evaluator to, to do the evaluation. Um, that, that, that would be my take. Alison, uh, anything else? You yeah, want I add? agree. We really want people to move towards having it um, just uh, part that, that there's ownership of the evaluation on the part of the principal investigators of, or their program directors, because um, you, you know specifically what the goals of the program are. And then, you know, you can certainly get help how to measure this and what's the best sampling that you do and, and what are the measures and that sort of thing and getting consulted. But we want, we want there to be ownership. There's certainly a place for external and one place that's obvious if you have a focus group with the students and they need to be able to be candid, you would want to hire a professional who knew how to give the information back to you without disclosing any information about the person who was voicing a concern. So there's obviously a place where you want an external third party. But 
a lot of this can be done embedded within the program and working with folks at the institution. It should not be a super expensive um, enterprise. We, we, what, we, what we don't want is to sort of feed an industry that, um, where people get evaluations that are not helpful or um, useful. So uh, I would also add that uh, it should be an unbiased evaluation and, and uh, I would uh, suggest that the program director or co-director would not be the right people to do the evaluation. It should be somebody uh, who can do it impartially. Stephanie, is that right? Um, I mean, yes, it's very variable. <laughs> We've seen lots of different types of evaluation and people come up with, with really clever ways of doing it. I think forcing people to come up with their own ideas has probably led to some really good new ways of doing this. So okay. there's no one size fits all, as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So uh, a couple questions about the program faculty. So the first one, in, in terms of the mentor training for the faculty, um, are there any expectations of frequency that they would receive training such as a refresher or anything like that? So as usual, I mean, we try really hard not to be prescriptive. I think that that's probably the worst thing we can do. You, you understand your context, you understand your faculty, um, you understand, uh, let's hope what some of the issues are that they would need focused or targeted training about. Um, and I think that, that um, there is data now and we are supporting research in the area of mentorship about frequency and things like that. So it's kind of early days and, and we encourage you to, to try things out and if possible measure what you're doing and then you can report back your own outcomes. But we don't have a prescription for you and I think um, you, it has to be context specific and we encourage you to read the literature on these topics because there is um, increasingly more literature on the area of mentorship and mentor training. The National Research Mentoring Network that NIH supports has, has been um, putting forth publications in this area. Okay, thank you. Um, sort of related question would be, how much of requirements, or, or in particular the new requirements here, how much of these need to be in place at the time that the application is submitted compared to how much should be proposed in the application? For example, the mentor training or um, support for faculty hiatus. So these are all new applications. Uh, I mean, uh, as Alison said, we don't expect any renewal. So it's what you are proposing, uh, not necessarily what's already in place. If something's already in place, you can talk about it, but I think we are looking at, in response to the requirements in the FOA, what is it that you are proposing? How are you gonna uh, meet all the expectations that are in the FOA? So it has more to do with your plan. So this is a question about defining overlap between training programs. So how is this overlap defined between training programs? Um, if it's defined by overlap of faculty, would that discourage interdisciplinary programs? So, so I don't think there's, there's not, I mean, it's not, they will look and see if a faculty member is off across a hundred different training grants. That's, that's a question of bandwidth, but it's understood given the interdisciplinary uh, nature of things that, that you're going to see faculty on, on multiple awards. The big, the big issue for us is commitment to training and bandwidth. And I think that that's just something that, and we have to give credit to the reviewers that they can they can figure this out, you know, that they can be aware. And I have to apologize because I'm late for another meeting where I'm giving a talk. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm really so sorry. I have to leave, but I, my great. Well, I'll, I'll can try to fill in as, uh, okay. as best right. as Bye. I can. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Alyssa. Um, another question about evaluation. So, how much of these assessments should be in place or planned? Uh, for the application, so the assessments in particular. So uh, again, for uh, new applications, uh, we are looking at the plans. Uh, uh, if you have something in already in place, you, you may talk about it, but uh, I think we are looking at what you plan to do, how you plan to do the evaluation, how you going to monitor 
the activities, the student progress, and and uh, those kind of things. But I invite Stephanie also to step in. I have to keep on muting. Um, yeah, again, I mean, these are new applications. And so, and if you've had a previous program and you happen to have had a really good evaluation plan that you've been using, please talk about it and how you're going to build on it. But if this really is a new, a new program, and for some of you, this really could be a reset. Uh, you may decide, you know, I want to start from scratch. Uh, I'm going to design a brand new program. Then you, as part of that, what are your plans for how you're going to evaluate it? What are the metrics are you going to use? Short and long-term metrics. Um, so it, it's uh, re reviewers are, are cognizant of where you are in the timeline of your program, and so they they they're not expecting that you have everything in place. But you need to at least be thinking about it and present what it is you're thinking about. Okay, great. Uh, for progress reporting. Um, would the progress reporting requirements for this FOA, are they likely to change as things move on? Is this a moving target? So uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't predict what will happen in the future. Um, uh, we have uh, one of our beliefs is, uh, is evolution. Uh, evolution of ideas, evolution of how we do things, how we can do what we do in, in a much better way, more effective and efficient way. And if we, uh, through our experience and, and in consultation with experts, we find that there is a way to further improve uh, what's already in the FOA, that that's likely to happen. So, but right now, uh, next month, uh, uh, for the next few months, uh, uh, there is no plan to change anything. Great. So this is a question about transdisciplinary, the, the area, the transdisciplinary area. Um, yes. Is it a requirement that each and every trainee be trained extensively in multiple disciplines, or is the intent that the program supports training in multiple disciplines that a trainee can select from? So uh, as the description uh, indicates, it's uh, that program is primarily designed for institutions that don't have uh, NIGMS funded training grants, except there's a couple of exceptions, uh, the biobehavioral interface and biostatistics, statistics, I believe. So if your institution has a strength in cell and molecular biology or cell and molecular biology plus something else, you propose a training program in that area. And just like, just like any other training program, uh, where students would be trained in his skills and, and, and all the things that Alison uh, mentioned, uh, you uh, basically uh, go by what the program's goals are, what, what goals you establish and, and propose. Um, there is no a uh, particular requirement that this program is, is any different than, than uh, a similar program at another institution where there are more T32s. Uh, so wherever your strength is in terms of faculty and students, resources, uh, that's where the program should be proposed in. Thank you. Um, a quick question about the bio sketch uh, for the faculty. So is there a certain length for the personal statement portion of the bio sketch? Stephanie? Uh, there's no length requirement for the personal statement. Um, at least there should be enough content there to, for reviewers to be able to evaluate that, um, you know, people really are invested in this and, and in what way they're going to be invested. But I, the main thing is that the bio sketch in total cannot be more than five pages, but each section um, is, you know, is variable. So just make sure you have all the information in there. Thank you. Um, this may have come up a little bit earlier, but just to make sure we're clear. So for the outcomes data in, that's reported in the tables, so should this be data from an existing program or the pool from which trainees will be selected? So if you have existing program, 
I, I think the instructions, uh, I have it right here. Uh, I would suggest that you follow the instructions. Uh, uh, if you have a program already in place, funded by an IGMS, then you should be talking about the success of the previous trainees. But given that these applications are going to be new, uh, it's uh, part three of table 8A is what, what's needed. And, and I'm looking at the instructions. Uh, it, it basically talks about uh, uh, for new applications, list sequentially all the students graduating in a field or from a program similar to the proposed program in the last five years who would have been eligible for the proposed program. So uh, in, in case of a, a really uh, totally new application, uh, not virtual new, you would be following this instruction. If you had a program, uh, you then can include the uh, out, outcome from, from that program. Uh, uh, am I right, Stephanie? Uh, yes, I think so. I think you are right. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. So for a competitive renewal application, would there be any potential due date extensions relevant, relevant to COVID-19? So, um, new uh, renewal, did you say competitive renewal? That's what the question said, yeah. So, uh, again, uh, I'm not aware of, uh, uh, on the, of all the applications that we funded through the previous FOA, that is 17341, uh, uh, that uh, they were all funded for five years, I believe, and, and so, there shouldn't be any renewal application. Uh, and I, I sure hope that, that uh, we as a nation uh, find something, uh, some vaccine or something to deal with COVID-19 and then we don't have to think about uh, an extension, but that would be a policy developed by NIH Central and, 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 uh, and then probably uh, our leadership at NIGMS uh, uh, at this point, um, I think that uh, that question may not uh, be an issue um, for the next date. Okay, thank you. Yeah, at this time, there's no extension of deadlines uh, to do with COVID at this point. Nothing's been um, announced. Okay, great. Okay, so um, is it likely that someone would receive, an application would receive a poor score if there was items that weren't, one item that isn't perfect, such as not having all the faculty bio sketches describe training and mentoring. So how would that impact the score? Um, so it's a package. <laughs> the, yeah. It's really the whole application. I mean, if there's a lot, a lot of things that are just haven't been well addressed, then the overall score may ultimately suffer. But um, I mean, just if one biosketch is missing, uh, um, a mentorship plan or uh, training, you know, I mean, that's gonna be a minor thing, um, and especially if the rest of the application is stellar. Um, but if there's a lot of these little things, um, they add up, they add up. And, and that could ultimately impact the score. Okay, thank you. There are a couple questions about table 6A. Um, so one is about extract. So um, will extract automatically exclude table 6A and include table A? And I know Dr. Singh, you posted a link to instructions for uh, removing uh, table 6A, but one comment was that it can't be removed if the application has already been started. So I believe that I, I had instructions for that too, and the, the PI who asked uh, um, is correct uh, because she's the one who is to, uh, made us think about it. Uh, um, uh, and, and so what you can do if you've already entered the data, uh, you can make a request to the ERA uh, desk and then they uh, can help you with that. Um, 
Um, I believe I included that when I updated the frequent the, the table section uh, on our website. Uh, but if it's not there, that's what you would need to do. Okay, great. Yeah. So this is a, a question for a multi from a multidisciplinary program, which is not only across different departments and schools, but also two different universities. So should there just be one institutional support letter or would two institutional support letters be needed, one from each university? So um, I will um, give my two cents worth and then I'll ask Stephanie to, to confirm. Uh, there should be one letter and it can have signatures from different institutions. You could have multiple signatures on the same letter, but you are asked to uh, include one uh, up to 10 pages letter on institutional commitment. Uh, uh, now, Stephanie, uh, did I get that right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So everything has to be in that one 10 page letter, um, and that includes um, all the signatures. Uh, we, uh, we, we went through a phase where people were sending in letters from different people addressing individual parts of what needs to be in that letter. And um, now we're, we're really very strict about it. Everything has to be in that one time page letter. We're not gonna accept multiple letters to cover everything that's required or requested. Okay, thank you. So a question um, in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, given uh, the extraordinary stressors um, that are apparent, um, there hasn't been too much discussion about where mental health and wellness support would come into play other than the institutional letter of support. So should this appear in the narrative or the appendix? So um, uh, that, that's a very timely uh, question and an issue that, that uh, uh, I thank the uh, question, uh, questioner to, uh, that for asking. Uh, I, I, you know, we, we, we had a seminar, a, a training ground seminar for the um, internal as well as external uh, folks uh, on this uh, because we thought that this is an important issue. Our, our leadership organized it. Uh, um, I think if, if uh, you are putting together an application in the current environment um, and, and if there is uh, uh, expectation that uh, the the situation is not going to change. Uh, perhaps you should talk about it uh, as part of your training plan. Um, that that might be useful. Uh, uh, it, it's not uh, uh, specifically required. I, I don't think in the FOA, but given the circumstances, uh, it, it might be uh, useful. But Stephanie, please. I mean, it, it certainly would, doesn't hurt <laughs> to say that this is something that's important to you and to your program and to include it. But again, it is, it is not a requirement yeah. at, this, at this stage. For, for all we know, we, this may change down the line with the, the next POA. Um, but uh, it doesn't hurt to include anything new, innovative, that you think is important for your, your, your students, your trainees. Thank you. And I'm, I'm talking, if I may, talking about the next FOA. Um, in addition to looking at the FOA, uh, uh, when you get ready to put together or think uh, about what elements in, in your training program is going to be, please look at uh, not only the FOA, but related guide notices. So uh, if, we dis if we find, uh, and we worked hard, to make sure everything's included in the current FOA. But if let's say next month, uh, somebody says, oh, you really missed this very, very important thing. And then we realize that, yes, we made a mistake. We should have included it. Then what we do is correct our mistake by issuing a guide notice. And then that guide notice is attached, the link to it is attached at the top of somewhere in the FOA. And, and you should uh, comply with the requirements of the guide notice as well. Great, That's yeah. great point, thank you. So is there, uh, in terms of the program director's effort, 
is there any certain percentage of effort of the program director that is expected um, in order to successfully run the training program? So uh, again, as Alison said, we, we try not to be prescriptive. Um, uh, and, and I think it, it's up to the program. The, uh, it, it, it'll, it'll have to be context specific uh, in, in a realistic way to run a well thought through program and, and do the monitoring and, and making sure everything's going uh, as, as expected. Um, you make a, a decision what's the minimum uh, or the optimum uh, amount of time that you need to spend uh, in consultation with your uh, institution. There is no uh, specific guidance on that. Uh, I, I would think that if we put um, 1%, 2%, 5%, the, 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 there might be a question whether that's enough uh, uh, time and effort. Uh, uh, we do not uh, provide uh, resources for uh, support of uh, the staff, the, uh, the program director or the coordinator. Uh, everything must come out of the 4200, which we actually hope that you spend on workshops, on, on skills workshops and, and things like that. Uh, so basically you make the decision, what's the optimum time that you need to run a program effectively and efficiently. It's a matter of bandwidth as well. I mean, you know, the program director has to have enough bandwidth. And so reviewers do look at what other things um, on the, the bio sketch um, of, of the, um, the, the PDPI, you know, what, what other things they're doing. I mean, this is where having a co-director can be very helpful. It's a way of having additional effort going into running the, the program. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there are still um, some questions about how to distinguish the training program from a graduate from the graduate program in terms of what is the value added so that the T32 is not just a funding mechanism for the trainees and yet the trainees don't become an elite group. So I think Dr. Lotus uh, and Gami um, explained that very well uh, uh, that we want the T32 to be the driver of the, the change, but we want the entire program, uh, all the students who are T T32 supported and those who are not, they all to benefit. Uh, we definitely don't want to create an elite group, uh, but we do want the T32 to drive the the uh, modernization of graduate education. Is, is John, John, are you still here? I'm okay. not sure. Uh, he's got uh, lots of things on his plate, so um, I didn't get a chance to thank him, but uh, I wanted him to add. Uh, but I hope that, that what I said is, is um, answers the question. Great. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, I had an email that we are some 20 minutes uh, uh, past. Uh, uh, if it's okay with uh, Stephanie and, and uh, Lisa, uh, we could go for another uh, to the hour, that is two o'clock, uh, uh, but we, we probably will need to stop. Um, but let me hear from, uh, you may have other commitments. Uh, I, I don't know. Stephanie? I I actually have to leave for another meeting, so I'm going to have to sign out. Okay. okay. Yeah, I have another meeting at two, so, <laughs> so. <laughs> do a few more minutes. <laughs> okay, that, that's what we'll do then. Um, uh, I, I, we, we can go for a few more minutes, uh, Tony. Okay, next, please. Next question. So I actually don't see any new questions right wow. now. Wow. I believe that I, I believe we've covered them all. Okay. But um, if you want to give people a couple more minutes, maybe there'll be another question thrown in here. Okay. okay so uh, with that, then, then uh, I, I would like to um, respond to one of the question, uh, 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 actually several of them uh, on, on the, this chat box. So what we do with the chat box, we go through 
and see if there's a question that we need to put that question and response to it under the frequently asked questions. And I gave you the link to in one of my answers. Uh, but if uh, the, there is a question that's already in the frequently asked question uh, section on our website, then we will not put that on again. Uh, and, and I, again, want to let you know that the whole thing is being recorded, including this question and answer uh, session. Um, and then therefore, uh, you should be able to uh, go to the video and then go to the last section, you know, where the questions and answer session begins and, and listen to it again. Um, so just wanted to let you know that. Right. And, and before I uh, forget, I, I do want to thank John, uh, Allison, Stephanie, and Lisa, and uh, Sidela, and everybody else who's uh, uh, from an IGMS that's online, especially PJ. Uh, without your help, this would have not been possible. Tony, of course, uh, uh, and if I'm missing somebody, I apologize, but uh, you guys were wonderful uh, in helping put together the seminar, uh, this webinar and in answering questions, in making presentations. Without you, none of this would be possible. So thank you so much. Uh, just maybe one or two questions if you have any. Yes. Um, well, it looks like Patrick answered one of the questions about the recommended ratio of trainee slots. Okay. Um, so one more question then is if a faculty member recently moved from another institution and is now a faculty mentor on the training grant, should their previous students at the other institution be included in table 5A and 8A? Stephanie? Uh, I actually don't know the answer to that one. Um, Isa is, is um, do you know Isa? He's one of the SROs. Um, okay, there we go. So I, I think we might have talked about this previously, but if uh, so, if it's they're going to be associate, if they're coming over with those students and those students will be associated with your program, they should be counted on Table Five. Oh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in Table Five A. Uh, and if you're talking about, I think there's Table 5A and Table 8A, which have very similar requirements about new faculty coming in. The training history of that faculty should also be considered, and they should also be listed as potential, like uh, their training history. So that I can't remember which one's which. But uh, again, if you have any questions, please reach out to me, and we can talk about it. So. Thank you, Isa. OK, great. So I don't see any more questions. So we looks like we have covered what we did. Okay. Well, again, thank you everybody and, and good luck with your application. Uh, if you do have a question, uh, uh, um, you send it to if it's a, a program related question or anything. If, if it's even not program related, I'm happy to have it. And if I cannot answer it, I'll certainly call on my colleagues at NIGMS to to uh, help me with the uh, response. So thank you again and good luck. Thank you everybody from NIGMS.